Welcome to Counterspin, your weekly look behind the headlines of the mainstream news. I'm Janine Jackson, here with Steve Rendell. This week on Counterspin, the International Atomic Energy Agency published its latest report on Iran on November 8th, but for nearly two weeks beforehand, news media were rife with leak-based stories promising the report would be game-changing. What did it actually say, and what of that is to be believed? We'll talk to Cyrus Safdari, who's tracking the story at IranAffairs.com. Also on the show this week, as the Occupy movement continues to focus attention on economic inequality, a spate of media coverage is presenting new census data as suggesting that poverty might not be as bad as we thought. What's that? We'll talk with professor and historian Francis Fox Piven about Occupy Wall Street and the new numbers on the poor. All that's coming up, but first, as usual, we'll take a look back at the week's press. Opponents of the Keystone Tar Sands Pipeline project, 10,000 of them by some reports, surrounded the White House on November 6th to call on Barack Obama to reject the deal. That generated a short metro section story in the Washington Post. More revealing, however, was the Post preview story a day earlier, which presented the issue as one where proponents talk about facts, while opponents are simply noise. Here's how Juliet Alperin's story begins. Quote, Canadian Ambassador Gary Dewar has a straightforward analysis of whether TransCanada will win the Obama administration's approval to build and operate an enormous pipeline to transport oil from Alberta to the Texas coast, close quote. Alperin quotes Dewar speculating on the White House's upcoming decision, quote, if it's made on merit, we're confident. If it's made on noise, it's unpredictable, close quote. Then she typifies opponents. Quote, foes of the project, which has become a test of how President Obama balances environmental considerations against economic and energy supply concerns, will try to turn up the noise Sunday with a rally around the White House. Unemployed workers who support the 1,700-mile Keystone XL pipeline are planning to counter with a blitz of media interviews over the weekend. Close quote. The article quotes six different sources from the company trying to build the pipeline, consultants working for the company, and U.S. and Canadian government officials. Climate activist Bill McKibben is the lone environmentalist voice quoted, and he's in the final paragraph. But then, once you've framed environmental activists as merely noise, there's no reason to cover them seriously. Washington Post correspondent Juan Ferrero had a piece on the Greek economic crisis November 4th in which he argued that two Latin American countries offer clear examples of the right and the wrong response. Quote, in a story that may provide a lesson for Europe, one country, Uruguay, that was on the edge of financial oblivion, organized a fast, orderly, and negotiated response that revived the economy and ended a run on banks. Another, Argentina, spiraled into a chaotic default and remains a pariah in world financial markets, close quote. Ferrero explains that Uruguay is now a darling of Wall Street, which he means in a good way, and boasts a fast-growing economy. As for pariah Argentina, the news is grim. The government, quote, still owes about $15 billion to hardcore creditors and has lost judgments in U.S. courts to pay up. With the country still blocked from tapping international capital markets, it is mostly because of booming demand for its agricultural products that Argentina has been lifted from economic calamity, close quote. Ferrero quotes a Uruguayan economist saying, nobody recommends the Argentine approach to anything. But the people in Argentina seem to think their approach is working, enough to re-elect Christina Kirchner, thanks in no small measure to the booming economy. As economist Mark Weisbrot wrote in The Guardian just before the election, Argentina has done remarkably well since defaulting on their international debt and blowing off the IMF nine years ago, chalking up real GDP growth of about 94 percent. That's the fastest economic growth in the Western Hemisphere. And the government has helped the benefits of that growth trickle down. Poverty and extreme poverty have been reduced by about two-thirds since a 2002 peak. Employment is at record levels. Social spending has nearly tripled in real terms. Weisbrot notes a cash transfer program for children that now reaches the households of more than 3.5 million children, probably the largest such program relative to national income in Latin America. 
But don't fall into that trap of economic growth and poverty reduction, the Washington Post seems to say. It's better to be loved by Wall Street. New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman wrote on November 9th that while India's grassroots movement to stamp out political corruption is superior to our Occupy Wall Street movement because it has a leader, clear demands, etc., there's a common thread between the movements. But Friedman makes a smart distinction. Quote, the difference is that Indians are protesting what is illegal, a system requiring bribes at every level of governance to get anything done. And Americans are protesting what is legal, a system of Supreme Court-sanctioned bribery in the form of campaign donations that have enabled the financial services industry to effectively buy the U.S. Congress and both political parties and thereby resist curbs on risk-taking, close quote. Here, here, Wall Street has bought the political process. But what can save us? A magical centrist internet-based third-party presidential candidate. That's what. Friedman says, the issues, Friedman says that the issues that have inspired Indian demonstrators and American activists have also inspired, quote, initiatives like americanselect.org, a centrist group planning to use the Internet to nominate an independent presidential candidate, close quote. Huh? American Select is the brainchild of a group of hedge fund investors, or as Friedman once reported, it's financed with some serious hedge fund money. These are the people who are going to deliver an outsider shock to the system that will curb the influence of the financial services industry? Wall Street will save us from Wall Street? There's an extra irony here, too. Corporate Democratic pollster Doug Schoen is the chief strategist for Americans Elect, the same Doug Schoen who was very recently proclaiming that Democrats should distance themselves from the Occupy Wall Street protests in a column in Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal. Another Sunday morning, another round of imbalanced talk show discussions. On ABC's This Week, November 6th, where Christiane Amanpour led off with a reference, humorous, we think, to a debate between Herman Cain and Newt Gingrich as a clash of the titans, the roundtable included George Will, Ariana Huffington, former George W. Bush strategist Matthew Dowd, and Newsweek columnist Neil Ferguson, author of the book Civilization, The West and the Rest. So, three conservatives and one liberal. Over at NBC's Meet the Press, at the table were Republican strategist Alex Castellanos, Wall Street Journal editorial board member Kim Strassel, MSNBC hardball host Chris Matthews, and Politico writer Maggie Haberman. That's two conservatives, a Beltway reporter, and Matthews, who's described himself recently as a George W. Bush voting pragmatist. And on CBS's Face the Nation, the guests were Ed Gillespie, former Republican National Committee chair, Ed Rollins, former Bachman campaign manager, Ken Blackwell, the Republican who presided over the controversial Ohio balloting in the 2004 presidential election and a Perry supporter, Liz Cheney, Republican consultant, and John Dickerson, CBS News political analyst. So four conservatives and a reporter. These Sunday shows offer the space for extended debate and discussion. It's such a shame to fill them mainly with the sound of echoes. And finally, New Yorkers were handed a laugh, no less hearty for being unintentional, by the November 4th cover of Rupert Murdoch's local tabloid, The New York Post. Enough, the front page headline exclaimed. Mr. Mayor, it's time to reclaim Zuccotti Park and New York's dignity. Dignity is a fine idea, but to say what everyone was thinking, what's it got to do with the New York Post? The paper ran a cover a few months back, headlined, Crazy Stocks Like a Hooker's Drawers, Up, Down, Up. Another cover photoshopped a skirt onto a Phillies baseball player with a headline about the Frillies coming to town. When the U.S. killed al-Qaeda militant Abu Musad al-Zarqawi, the Post cover was a large photo of the dead man's face, with a speech bubble reading, warm up the virgins. And who could forget the Iraq war classic, UN meets weasels to hear new Iraq evidence, with weasel heads photoshopped onto the representatives from Germany and France. There are many things you might ascribe to Murdoch's New York Post. Few would have anything to do with dignity. Thanks, Steve. You're listening to Counterspin, brought to you each week by the Media Watch Group Fair. (music) 
Media coverage in advance of the International Atomic Energy Agency's latest report on Iran was sensational. For more than a week before its publication, news accounts based on leaks promised the IAEA report would be game-changing and suggested Iran was on the brink of developing nuclear weapons. Iran close to nuclear capability, IAEA says, was the headline on a November 7th Washington Post story, while the same day's New York Times said the report would feature, quote, the strongest evidence yet that Iran has worked in recent years on a kind of sophisticated explosives technology that is primarily used to trigger a nuclear weapon, close quote. But now that the report is out, what did it actually say and how much of that can be trusted? We're joined by Cyrus Safdari, who's been keeping track of the IAEA on the website iranaffairs.com. Welcome back to Counterspin, Cyrus Safdari. Thank you for having me. Could you begin by comparing what the report actually said to what news media promised in stories before it was published? Well, the news media had essentially sensationalized this beyond anything else probably ever published by the IAEA. There were all sorts of reports about how this was going to be the ultimate damning evidence. I believe the CNN actually ran a headline saying that the IAEA had concluded that Iran was working on nuclear weapons, no alleged or unverified or anything like that attached to it. However, in reading the actual report itself, pretty much everyone noticed that it wasn't actually saying anything new. It was pretty much the same as before, with the one major exception that they had um, included an annex of the so-called alleged studies to the report. But even there, there wasn't anything really new. Uh, Much of these uh, alleged studies had been leaked to the public before, in September 2009, in fact. Why is this done? Why do we see this pre-spin, pre-report spin? Uh, It seems seems to happen each time the IAEA issues a report on Iran. Well, in in my blog, I I refer to this as basically showbiz. This is part of the perception management program that place. It doesn't really matter what the IAEA report itself says as much as what people think it says. So what happens on a usual basis is that the IAEA report, which is supposed to be confidential, by the way, is uh, initially leaked to select people in the press, and they basically run with it and try to outdo each other and try to make most damning and most hyped headlines associated with it. And then when the actual report is issued, when people, you know, like me, who don't have much else to do with their time, actually sit down and read through the darn thing, they realize that it doesn't actually say much of what it was attributed to it. It's very interesting because once the report was published, there was still a lot of sensational coverage. CBS Evening News reported that Iran appears to be slowly closing in on a nuclear weapon, while USA Today ran a story under the headline, UN Agency Issues Red Alert Over Iran's Secret Nuke Program. It's funny because there's is so little new in the report, reporters could not actually quote anything sensational from the report So many were reduced to finding officials to say that the report really changed everything. For instance, the red alert headline in USA Today was actually from a quote of a hardline Republican member of Congress. So they actually had to make an extra effort to find sensational things in this in this uh, report, didn't they? Well, the report itself, to the extent that it actually says anything accusatory against Iran, uses such hedging language that it doesn't you can't really get a grasp on what it is actually alleging. But we have to give credit where credit is due. You know, several mainstream uh, news organizations also pointed out that the report didn't actually contain what was supposedly attributed to it. Scott Pearson of the Christian Science Monitor, who has a long history of covering Iran, went out and actually contacted some uh, former weapons inspectors who, who expressed surprise at the thinness of the evidence against Iran, and one of them actually said that this sounds like they were a very politicized uh, report. Brian Whitaker of The Guardian, uh, even Julian Borger, who is, uh, whose previous coverage of Iran left something to be desired, uh, all of these pointed out that there is something pretty fishy about this, uh, this latest report. Well, in addition to the fact that on the main issue that IAE is supposed to monitor the transfer of nuclear material from civilian to military use, uh, the IAE report basically vindicates Iran. But one of the IAE's findings, which was instantly challenged by you and others, has to do with Iran's supposed high explosive program. 
What's wrong with what the IAEA found there? In the leak, which was made apparently to David Albright of ISIS, a think tank dedicated to nuclear material, apparently it was told to him, and he, he presented this information during uh, some sort of meeting, that a certain Russian, but uh, turned out to be Ukrainian, uh, nuclear scientist, turned out not to be a nuclear scientist, uh, was aiding Iran in conducting high, ex- high explosives testing using a certain technology which can be applied to nuclear bombs. A blogger at the moon of Alabama actually sat down and simply Googled the guy's name, and it turned out that the fellow was not a nuclear scientist at all, but it was in fact involved in the manufacture of industrial diamonds using high explosions. This happened even before the report itself. The IAEA report was actually made public. So basically the report was debunked. A major claim of the report was debunked even before the report was actually made public. Wow, that, there's just so many problems with this report. But finally, I want to ask you, in the independent press and some international media, we've seen discussion of how much the IAEA has become politicized in recent years. I would also include the Christian Science Monitor piece you mentioned. And there's also a good piece on PBS's Frontline um, website. Yes, by well, Dr. Sahimi. Yes, a, a very deep uh, piece analyzing the evidence. How have the U.S. media been doing in covering this increasing politicization of the IAEA? As typical, we, we have most of the mainstream media running with the official line, basically. We see examples of Joby Warwick over at the Washington Post, who basically acted as a mouthpiece for the David Albright presentation I referred to earlier, and Mm -hmm. he simply repeated what he was told from a deliberate leak, and apparently had not even bothered to run a Google search on, for example, the name of this nuclear scientist, this alleged nuclear scientist, and yet this was presented on the Washington Post as fact. So there is quite a bit left to be desired by the coverage. However, um, in the quickness and basically the report was debunked within 12 hours of it being issued, uh, mostly attributable to the work of independent journalists and bloggers. So there is quite a bit of room for optimism here. We've been speaking with Cyrus Safdari. You can read his writing, Tracking Developments About Iran and the IAEA, at iranaffairs.com. Thanks again for joining us today on Counterspin, Cyrus Safdari. Thank you. Respect is saying too much, but the Occupy movement has garnered the acknowledgement of a corporate press corps inclined for any number of reasons to ignore it. Still, coverage is centered on the protesters themselves without necessarily engaging their ideas or allowing those ideas to shape reporting. It's entirely possible for media to say these ideas matter and still not act as though they do. How, for example, does media's interest in the 99% affect their understanding of how poverty is defined or whose perspectives should be included in news on the economy? Our next guest is an expert on political movements, among other things. Francis Fox Piven teaches political science and sociology at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. She's written many books, including Challenging Authority, How Ordinary People Change America, and 1977's Poor People's Movements with Richard Cloward. Who's Afraid of Francis Fox Piven is a new collection of her writings out now from the New Press. Welcome back to Counterspin, Francis Fox Piven. Glad to talk to you, Janine. Well, when Cornell West and Tavis Smiley toured the country talking about poverty recently, they ran into a CNN host named Carol Costello, who confronted them with the idea that the poor actually have it better than the middle class. And she cited the Heritage Foundation and said that poor people have microwave ovens and they even have a refrigerator. What are they complaining about? Well, that was a very vivid example. She went on to then say that People think the poor are leeches on society who are just, you know, sucking everything out of us. But a few months later, one could be forgiven for getting essentially the same message from the New York Times headline, 
bleak portrait of poverty is off the mark, experts say, over an article about the recalibration of the poverty rate that also cites Robert Rector from Heritage, saying people's idea of poverty is much worse than the reality because many poor people have Xboxes. What do you make of this push to redefine poverty or to fiddle with the numbers? Is it, is it really changing how many people are poor and the scale of the problem? Well, it certainly does not. And it is fiddling with the numbers, as you say. You can maybe get it down a point or two by saying, well, we don't now include food stamps in the income we count And that's true. On the other hand, they don't count most of the expenses that people, including poor people, have that have been going up at a much faster rate than the cost of a basic market basket of food. Now, the poverty rate is determined by that basic market basket of food. At least that's the way we do it in the United States. Much can be criticized about that, including the fact that doesn't take account of rising transportation costs, of rising health care costs, of the costs that a lot of families have to pay for daycare. So it's an unreal number for that reason. But it can also be criticized because poverty is not just a measure of how much cabbage and potatoes you need to live on. Poverty lines in other country countries are determined by how distant this portion of the population is from the median income. Now, there's a meaning in that different measure. And the meaning is, what they're saying is that there should be a measure that is somehow takes account of marginalization, of exclusion from the kind of life that most people live. However, I really do think that all of this jabbering about poverty measures up a decimal point or down a decimal point are beside the point. Everybody has to agree that poverty is increasing. Whatever reasonable measure you use in the United States and the right-wing line about that fact, which is so awesome and awful, is that the poor have only themselves to blame. Not that we should jiggle with whether we count food stamps or don't count food stamps. The main message is that the poor are poor because they have bad character. The poor are poor because they are virtually a criminal class, which is why we have welfare departments now which require that any applicant get fingerprinted or get tested for drugs, something that is so humiliating that many people won't even apply no matter how grave their need is. But, you know, for at least 35 years in this country, we have been exposed to politician arguments that say that the worst thing you can do about poverty is to help the poor because it only worsens the character problems that are at root in accounting for their poverty. In a recent essay that published in The Nation and elsewhere, you wrote, the Occupy Wall Street movement has already made the concentration of wealth at the top of this society a central issue in American politics. Now it promises to do something similar when it comes to the realities of poverty in this country, which underscored for me that these aren't the same phenomena. But is it possible to engage in equality and not talk about poverty? It certainly is. Most of the time, there's some acknowledgement of the fact that the very affluent, the biggest corporations, are chiseling on their taxes, for example, and that that isn't good for the group, whoever is meant by this, the middle class. We talk endlessly about the middle class and how we have to improve the circumstances of the middle class. Now, that seems to me to be a very evasive kind of formulation because, for one thing, most working people, are they middle class? Well, most of them are scampering to sort of stay above to keep up with their mortgage and have enough food on the table and they're working too many hours. Is that middle class? I don't know. 
But by saying middle class and middle class and middle class, we are almost explicitly excluding people who are really badly off. And I don't think we should do that. I don't think that's a democratic thing to do. I don't think it's a moral stance to take. And I think that Occupy Wall Street, when it says we are the 99%, and when it welcomes the homeless into their encampments, and when it shares its food with poor people, is saying that too. It's saying it's all of us except the 1%. And I think that's a big step forward in political discussion in the United States. Finally, Michael Parenti wrote a piece in which he talked about Occupy Walnut Creek, (laughs) Walnut Creek being a comfortable conservative suburb in Northern California. He says, according to one local TV station, some 400 people took part, average age between 40 and 50. And he said participants admitted that they lived fairly prosperous lives but still felt a kinship with the millions of Americans who were enduring an economic battering. Is this different, do you think? And what does this suggest to you about this movement going forward? Occupy Wall Street has so far demonstrated real talent for creating and projecting symbols which communicate to Americans a sense of unease and a kind of powerful critique of inequality in the United States. They've done that about, you know, Wall Street fortunes, about the big bonuses, about the criminality at the top. And I think they are now moving to reach out to and to bring into our discussion the suffering that our society has imposed on a lot of people at the bottom. We've been speaking with Frances Fox Piven. Her latest book, Who's Afraid of Frances Fox Piven? The Essential Writings of the Professor Glenn Beck Loves to Hate is out now from the New Press. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Janine. And that's it for Counterspin for this week. Counterspin is produced by FAIR, the national media watch group based in New York. If you missed part of today's show or you'd like to hear previous shows, you can find them on FAIR's website. It's FAIR.org. The show is engineered by Kelly Spivey at Mercer Media. With me is Steve Rendell. I'm Janine Jackson. Thank you for listening to Counterspin. Counterspin.